So I am part of the exhibits team, and we produce exhibits that help communicate the science from the Biodiversity Research Center. So we want to get everyone excited about the natural world and what goes on in it. We also produce temporary exhibitions, so I will come up with layouts for the space and also print the signage and the different parts that go around the exhibition and show you all the way through it. I also take a whole bunch of photos and videos to help promote the museum and document what we do. And I also produce some of our graphics and marketing materials using my photos and illustrations. So I get to use my creativity to help inspire people about biodiversity, and this is a fantastic job for me. Because I was always the kid who wanted to know the name of every bird and every plant. And we went to the library and we took out all the nature documentaries on VHS. <laughs> and then I ended up eventually at UBC studying, thank you, <laughs> studying biology, but also taking visual arts courses and not being able to choose which one I wanted to do and not having any idea what kind of career this would lead me to, but just hoping that someday something would show up. So Diane showed up. So she is a zoology professor, Diane Shustava. And she came to my ecology class and told us about a field course she was teaching in the remote part of northwest Costa Rica in a field station somewhere. And I don't even like camping, but I signed up. <laughs> and so we were on the side of a mountain in the pouring rain, and the whole road just turned to mud, and we had to walk for two hours. And there were venomous snakes and giant, giant spiders and logs underneath of which were huge colonies of Apillionids and cockroaches and scorpions. <laughs> but we were too busy to care because we had labs to do every day and then we had a research project we had to execute before the trip ended. And really, we were just in awe of the entire place. We got to see troops of howler monkeys going through the trees. We saw helicopter damselflies, which defy gravity when they fly. I hiked up to a cloud forest covered in mosses and orchids, and we stood there with no view at all because we were socked in, but it was still magic. And of course I had to draw it as much as I could. So I drew our field station, and I gave everyone a copy of this drawing when we got home. And Diane noticed. So she asked me if I had ever drawn a mite which I had not. <laughs> I had never even seen them close up till then. <laughs> so Diane works on model microcosms to study community ecology. So she looks at the microarthropod community living within mosses to then do experiments and model what happens to the whole structure of organisms that live in there. So what she needs to do is look at like a palm-sized piece of moss, dry it out, look at everything that falls out of it, and broadly categorize what everything is in order to tell what's going on in the community structure. And it's not just one thing that falls out. It's a whole bunch of things. <laughs> so the next summer she hired me to work in her lab and I sorted through a whole bunch of these samples. <laughs> and it's not like there's only a couple dozen things that are in there. There are hundreds and hundreds of things. This is about a quarter of the diversity we had at the time. So the problem was, at the time, the thing we were using to tell apart all these different things was a binder full of pencil sketches, and it was not very efficient. So we had some new tools at our disposal. We had a brand new microscope with a camera and a depth of field reconstruction kit, so you could take a whole bunch of images and composite them together. And then we also had, hopefully, what I could bring which was some illustration. So I illustrated over 500 different types of microarthropods. <laughs> and I put them all into a website, and this is still online. They've maintained it beautifully. Uh, so if you go in here and you click on one of these, you get to a description of that species. So this is the illustration as well as a photograph. So I was taking thousands of photographs of all the different things that we had collected, and I was working in a windowless microscope room, which was also the network printer room, which meant that everyone in the floor walked in. <laughs> and one of those people, Wayne Madison. So Wayne is one of the world's experts in the Salticidae family of jumping spiders. You may recognize him from his Curiosity Collider presentation. Uh, he's also director of what was then the Spencer Entomological Museum. So that is all the arthropod and insect specimens, terrestrial arthropods, uh, in the university. So that became part of the BD Biodiversity Museum, and he was also on the planning committee for 
the, the thing which hadn't existed yet. But he called an open meeting, basically, because we had our first event coming up. And we needed an idea of who we were visually. How do we promote this? What is the museum? So I got to sit in on that meeting where I had a whole bunch of very distinguished professors and all the people who were my former instructors. And we tossed around a bunch of ideas with each other. And by the end of it, I had the task of coming up with not just this poster, but we also inadvertently, I guess, came up with the logo concept, which was just an early sketch. And then this is what we're still using today, which I've had to live with for a long time now. So now I like it. <laughs> And I was basically finished with the lab work, and when this wrapped up, I was kind of unemployed. So if people here are going through their whole career arcs and you, you think that, okay, you're kind of at a point where nothing's really happening, that happens a lot. It only looks smooth looking backwards. So uh, the event came around, and I still had no job. Thanks, Mom and Dad, for being supportive. Um, and I talked to... Jeanette Witten, so she is the director of the herbarium, so that's the plant collection that we have at the university. And I told her, I'm not working, I want to volunteer. So she sent me upstairs to their room full of thousands and thousands of press plants and thousands of shoeboxes full of moss. And I met Linda and Olivia, who are our collection managers, and I said, your website is broken, I want to fix it for free. And no one's turning down that offer. <laughs> So we fixed it. Um, I didn't design it, I just made it work. Uh, and then, <laughs> this is 2005 as well. Uh, also, then we started and getting more ambitious, so we started putting parts of the collection online. On the right side are all the vascular type specimens. So those are kind of the most important specimens in the collection. We wanted to get them out there. And it was something that museums were just starting to do at the time. So after a few months of volunteering there, I got an email from Linda and she says, I found this job posting you should apply, and it was for the Museum of Anthropology at EBC. Yes. <laughs> so they were undergoing a massive project. They were doing a huge renovation of their building, and they were going through their entire collection, which was 35,000 things, and they wanted to document everything. So they hired me as part of a team of photographers, and we went through basically the entire breadth of human creativity. And human creativity gets weird sometimes. <laughs> so there were yeah, things from all over the world. There were some things which were definitely human skulls, and some things which were rumored to be shrunken heads, although we weren't really sure because sometimes they just make them for tourists and they make them out of like animal leather, and you can't tell. Uh, I should also mention MOA has excellent policies for dealing with anything with hum that has human remains and everything that's treated very well and very respectfully. But yeah, every day we went in was a trip around the world and I stayed there two years. I photographed 11,000 different things and I only broke four of them. <laughs> Sorry. And then I left because this thing happened. So this is a blue whale. In 1987, an adult female blue whale washed up on the shore of Prince Edward Island. And then they buried her because they didn't know what else to do and they couldn't move her anywhere. So then in 2007, the Beattie Biodiversity Museum sent a team to go in there and see if it was still there, and it was. So in 2008, they dug it all up. I wasn't hired at the time, but I was over here, and they were sending me images and I was putting them out there so that other people could download them and get all the information they wanted. But they did hire one person, and that was Kim Wilcox, so she's up there in the middle. And so her job was to be the director of everything, education and outreach, and all the public side of the museum. And it was a very big job, so she hired me in 2008, and we had so much to do. Uh, so we were still talking with the architects and the fabricators who were putting together our cabinets. We still had to move two million specimens over from the next building, and the rooms were empty, so we needed some help. So we hired people to work on the front end, and I hired a team of two- and three-dimensional designers. So <laughs> these people were amazing. They actually had proper design training, unlike me. Uh, so I could learn a ton from them, uh, even though they were supposed to be working for me. So we worked flat out for months, and we put together 1,200 graphics panels for the front of our cabinets and over 500 exhibits uh, to try to get us to opening day. And the whale beat us there by like six months. But in October of 2010, we opened a museum. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> So at the bottom there, that's me, that's Wayne, and that's Bob. Bob is member number 001, and he is still a member today, and that makes me very happy. So we kept going, we didn't stop there. So we put in a giant 30 meter timeline that goes back to the start of the formation of the Earth, and I illustrated everything that happened in the last 500 million years. <laughs> We planted a teaching garden outside. We started a program of loan boxes, which can come to you and your school and your class or your group, and you can bring part of the museum to you. We also created a temporary exhibit program, so now we work with local artists, and we showcase the intersection between art and science all the time. This is very cool, and now I get to pass on what I know to other people. So I work with work learn students who are from UBC. I also work with volunteers and I am a mentor to other museum professionals in the British Columbia Museums Association, which surprises me when I think about it. Um, because really, I'm just doing the same stuff I did when I was a kid. You know, I get to be crazy about nature, I get to make things, I get to experiment, I get to learn, and they pay me. <laughs> and then last year, the president of UBC gave me an award for creativity and innovation. <laughs> But that's not the most rewarding thing. What that is is something that I didn't really see coming, and that's the same thing that we're building here tonight. And that's the community of people that's grown up around the museum. So these are some of our amazing staff and faculty and curators and students. But it's also our members and our visitors, which hopefully includes more of you than what I saw before. Hopefully all of you, eventually. Um, and it's also our volunteers who, when I talk to them, they tell me that visiting our museum is what made them want to come to UBC and want to study science. And that the reason that they want to volunteer is the same reason that I just did all this stuff, which is to inspire people, all of you hopefully, to love the living world. So thank you. rewarding thing. 